Right, I'm right. Rashid Hook and Laru. I'm delighted to be back here with Diana Herbert. And, um, you know, we were just talking about, for those people who haven't watched part one, we were talking about organisations generally yeah. and advancing yourself and moving forward in your career. Yeah. Um, uh, and your background, on the one hand, you worked in HR, ended up being a HR director. And I love the bit where you're talking about the ascendancy. You, I mean, it's, it's it, music to my ears when somebody who's keen and enthusiastic can really advance in their, in their career. And you were talking a little bit about how you were supported mm -hmm. by the then director of HR when you were working for a part of um, Walt Disney um, um, to head up um, there in HR. I want to talk a little bit, and of course now you're a coach yeah. um, and you work with organisations going through change. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about that now in mm -hmm. terms of organisations going through change. Well, first of all, then, I guess the, there's an obvious thing. How did you change? from being HR director to then being a coach. And I would imagine that if you're doing very well, I mean, um, Walt Disney, Channel 4, these aren't small, these are the kind of dream yeah. jobs for somebody in HR. Diageo before that. And where before? Diageo. Diageo. Yeah, so good, good so good yeah. How did you, because I think lots of people are watching this, because this is the nut of it. They, most people, I think, want to advance in their career. Mm. Um, so I want to kind of ask two questions. Mm. What do you think was the secret of you I'm achieving the success that you've achieved personally um, because I'd just really like to hear that because I think that so many people want to get on well and perhaps people who specifically perhaps want to follow your footsteps within HR. What was that? You, you earlier talked about how you were mentored and you were supported yeah. in, in, in that, that early role but, but how did you get to where you're sat there now? I think in HR the secret is to be really interested in how business is run. Right. Um, and I, if I'm being a little bit bold, I think that's where some people go wrong in HR is they think it's all about the people. And of course it's all about the people, but actually the way that I saw my role is that I was a fellow business partner that happened to be responsible for the people mm -hmm. relevant to the business strategy. So then so did the organisation see that you brought something extra to the table because you, yeah. you were keen on how they, how they were performing as an organisation exactly. and how that could be? And also because the HR solutions aren't there because they're interesting technical solutions. You have to understand where the business is heading, mm -hmm. what's the issue or the problem that the mm -hmm. business has got to try and solve and how can you get the right. HR solution to right. fit that. I see. Um, well, yeah. for me now as a coach, you know what I'm fascinated? Yeah. I now see how then the jump from yeah. there to the work that you do exactly. now. To, it's, uh, yeah. it's a lot. I mean, I qualified as a coach back in 2007. Right. Because for me, it was pulling together a lot of the, the threads, really, of, um, of some of the work that I was doing. Was is, that deliberately to add, was that to add yeah. to your skill set within that HR concept? Yes, and to, also to understand the theory and the technique right. of what I was in, instinctively doing. Because right. a lot of conversations that I would have would be about um, change, difficult situations, mm -hmm. or you know, trying to help people get from point A to point B, mm -hmm. whether that be organisationally or personally. Right. And, and and so it was a, a natural extension, if you like, mm -hmm. of what I was doing anyway. So then, so having established yourself in, in HR, doing very well, and um, HR director for these big companies. Then that shifts yeah. to then be your own boss. I mean, very briefly, because I'm going to come back to the bit about change and organise. Yeah. But I'm curious about that. And um, why and how did you go about that? It's um, it was it's a hard decision because certainly Telefor, where I was up until recently, is an amazing organisation, mm. and it's really mm. hard to leave something that you love and go. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and do my own thing. It probably took me about two years to summon up courage to to do it. But I think at some point you've got to follow your dreams and, and I thought about the bits of my role that I love the most and that really energise me and make me happy mm -hmm. and coaching, change consultancy, helping organisations solve nutty complex change mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. is what I love to do. And, and that's fascinating what you're saying there because as, as I'm listening to you I'm thinking um, <clears throat> that's also a natural part of the organisational mm -hmm. um, process isn't it? We start, you talked a little bit about starting earlier on in your particular career, you talked a little bit about that development, and then we all get to a point in our career, don't we, whereby, can I grow within the organisation, um, do I want to move on to another organisation, and do that, or do I want to do something else, and my skill set's also pointing me in this other direction, yeah. um, which I think perhaps if we get a little bit of time, we'll touch back on that. But then, <clears throat> let's talk about organisations and change. Yes. I guess that you've seen a lot of change in a lot of organisations. Why is it that, um, let's be blunt about it, most people who I've ever spoken to in my own personal experience before I was a coach, 
awful, painful, difficult. Um, many people feel it's done really badly. Um, um, communication goes awry. People feel as though they're not valued. People often feel that consultation processes aren't that. They're just a, um, a, a box ticking exercise. Um, I'd love your perspectives on that. Um, I guess particularly now and mm. with all of because you've got wear so many hats that are useful for that. What's your yeah. what's your observation on that top line stuff? Yeah, know? I mean, I think I think you've you've highlighted a lot of the reasons why change does go awry. I mean, you know, I, yes, I've seen some tricky change, but I've also seen and been involved in some really positive change. Not necessarily because what we were doing was positive, but but because it worked and because we brought people along with us and, and I think when that actually happened what we were doing is that we were setting a clear context. Right, yeah. We were This is who we are, this is what's going on, this is what's going this on in the marketplace, this is why we need to do it, right? We were being clear about the fact that we recognise it's difficult for people. Right, yes. um, we were treating people with dignity and respect. I'm presuming you're painting the picture of where we're going. Yeah, and this is what's going exactly. to look like. And, it, and it's context and clarity. Right. I mean, I think you know, change is difficult in that, as human beings, we tend to prefer the status quo. We mm -hmm. tend to prefer things to be mm -hmm. the way that they are. Mm -hmm. And I think when when change is being done to you, mm -hmm. and you don't understand why, and you don't understand well, where's this taking us, why is this happening, it's even more difficult. Mm -hmm. I think you know people are afraid of what they don't know, probably more than when they do know. Even if the change is hard, you know, we deal with adults, we deal with responsible people, who when you say, listen, um, this is why we need to do this, and in, unless you can make that strength of business case, well, you've got to start asking your questions. I think you're absolutely right. I couldn't agree with you uh, more. I think my experience as a, as a coach and, um, and through in organisations through change, I think that people are incredibly resourceful and fine, mm. even with difficult change, What's key is the communication and how yeah, that they're absolutely. treated um, fairly and, and, and so on. Tell me, um, I, I wonder at that note, just a couple of tips, oh. if you would, in terms of organisations, um, if they're going through that process, yeah. and I guess particularly for the managers who can have to be the, the deliverers of change, and I guess and you've already pointed to some of that, um, and then any tips for individuals who find themselves going through that, that, yeah. that change? I mean, I think individual change is, is a whole different Yes. I mean, I, I think for organisations that are leading change, mm -hmm. for me the biggest thing is really be clear about what you're doing and why you're doing it, yes. and don't be afraid to communicate. Yeah. Communicate what you don't know as well as what yeah. you do know, but tell people by when you will come back to them, and then keep your promises. And presumably with that, what needs to happen is from the top down and through all the yeah. struggles of management, that needs to be aligned. Right. Well, um, dipping back into when you um, worked in um, as a HR director, and I love the fact that you talked about um, the, you know, the business case and you're mindful about that. Do you have a take that maybe HR directors should be, you know, I'm, no, I'm sure that there's good, bad and indifferentness with everything, um, should have also that courage and not be afraid to show their value to the organisation and to, and to really help that organisation through that process? Because I guess you are a key you're not just functional thingy. I mean, I'd love your take on yeah. that. What, what, what's the what's the role for HR and HR directors? I'm not saying it's just down to them, of course, the leadership exactly. and all stratas, but I would imagine this is an area that HR can really make sure it's done right and it's yeah. not done right and doesn't turn ugly or costly. No, and I, and I think you, you pick on a very key word for me there, which is courage. Mm. And I think, you know, sometimes the HR role has to, it has to, tell the business difficult things. It mm -hmm. has to have the courage to be able to say, actually, you know what, you're wrong. We don't do it, we shouldn't be doing it this way. And you've got to be able to stand up for the courage of your convictions. Mm -hmm. You've also got to think about the implications for the people. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about, well, we need this change, what's the quickest mm -hmm. way from, you know, from point A to point B. You've got to think about how you bring the people mm -hmm. along. And you know, I'm a big fan of, people who know me will know that I say this an awful lot, the hare and the tortoise race. Mm -hmm. So many people are worried about mm -hmm. you know being the hare, getting as quick mm -hmm. as they can to finish mm -hmm. the race, and actually sometimes you need to take a bit more slow, more circuitous route to get where you need to and get the change to last and embed. Mm -hmm. If that means that you bring people with you, and, and I think patience sometimes. Yeah. 
but also um, being as an HR person, being prepared to really stand your ground when it's a question mm. of what you believe from a values point of view mm -hmm. is the right thing for the organisation and the right thing for the people right. in it. And I'd imagine with that then everyone and all the managers within the organisation also need to be mindful about that because everyone's growing as well. Um, so that you're actually at that, um, active within that whole kind of process and think yeah. about what's best for us as an organisation, what's going to work for us as a team, what can I add and so on and not be again having the courage. Yeah having the courage there. And uh, I just wonder, is there any other um, comments you want to make there about, um, I mean, you said you've seen some examples of really good organisational change. Well, and, yes, and some, a lot of the stuff that we did at Channel 4, I think we did really well. Can you give us some examples about what um, the, the, those kind of good things, because I, I, I guess many people who are watching this may well be themselves in organisations large or small, and particularly let's face it, the climate that we've been in probably for the last eight, ten, best of ten years really has been a challenging environment, public sector, um, many huge numbers of people are losing their jobs, organisations have become slimmer, private sector elements of that have had similar things, even in industries like financial services where many people might, thought might be untouched. So people across the board um, will recognise some of the things that we're talking about. Are there any other things that you've seen in terms of best practice that you would just highlight and bring to people's attention that, again, yeah. and perhaps in addition to that, some, might be some practical I mean, it's, it's, some, it's picking up something that you said earlier about consultation, is when you do have to go through big change and requires mm -hmm. consultation, and obviously not all of it does, but when you do have to do that, for me the key word is meaningful. Mm. And, you know, yes, of course, some people go through it as a tick box exercise, as you, as you said, but I think for me, if it has to be done meaningfully and what mm. that is is that you listen to mm. feedback that you are open because mm. you know? it might be some power because i guess you know picking up on that what you're saying is of course um it might be very clear vision and it might be full sorts of reason that it ends up having to look like yeah. x but actually you're still there might be if it's real and if it's meaningful and genuine there may also be some powerful stuff that emerges mm -hmm. from that. Absolutely. That there might be warning bells. There might be things, uh, new opportunities. Since when did we have all the good ideas? Yeah, right, you know, I like say. If you harness the power of the, the collective and all, uh, the ideas that everybody brings, the perspectives. Right. So it brings in your words, trust. I've heard you yeah. mention. So you've got to trust in this. You've got to trust your leaders. You've got to trust your, your, your staff. You've got to trust people throughout that and. Yeah. And recognise that you're all in it together. Yeah. Mm. And as, as you say, sometimes the outcome isn't what employees want, and you can't promise that, and mm. that's not what it's about. Mm. And I think it is about going into it with the spirit of we want to hear what you say, yeah. uh, we want to try and find the best possible solution given our circumstances, yes. and you know we want to work together with you on it. Right. You know what? There's so many things talking to you here. I could talk to you for absolutely hours. I'm looking. No, I'm looking at the. I'm just looking at my time. And um, I'm just thinking that what might be good at some point is it might be great to interview a number of these individual yeah. themes um, in terms of to pick up some of these themes about best practice. It might well be, you know, we touched on briefly, very brief, very briefly, when somebody's having their, um, their annual assessment. Yeah. There might be things like that. There might be going for a consultation exercise. There might be a number of these things. We but didn't even get time for personal change. We didn't even get time for that personal change. But, but before we do close, I just want to talk a little bit about um, your role and what it is that you do now, yeah. because you've moved from um, HR director to coach our world. Exactly. <laughs> Tell me, um, what excites you about that? Is it about that you really be able to, that you can help so many different organisations? What's it uh, that attracts you about the work that you do now? And how would you word and describe for people watching this now what it is that you do now? I suppose there's two things. On the coaching side, what has always made me um, very happy and I've enjoyed massively is when I'm working with somebody as a coach and their light bulb goes on. Mm -hmm. This is privately, is this privately, most people come yeah. to you? Yeah. Um, I find that massively rewarding. Right, right, yeah. um, when they figure out for themselves what the answer is, right, yes. I get a lot from that. Yes, yes. Um, and from a cons consultation point, sorry, a consultancy point mm -hmm. of view, it's really about, I love what I call three dimensional jigsaw mm -hmm. puzzles. Mm -hmm. I love um, the organisation challenge, mm -hmm. the people element, mm -hmm. and then if there's an international element, even better, mm -hmm. and how we get all of those three things to align and land 
in the right so place. So what kind of right projects time. might people bring to you where they might need your help and your support? Naughty change. Uh-huh. You know, we're not in two words, yes, naughty change. I think it's like those complex, we know where we need to get to, we think, but we haven't got a clue how to get from this point to that point. Right. Or um, that we're not sure how to help our employees get from this right. point to that point. I hadn't intended to ask this, time, but I think it's an important point, and you'll have two perspectives. When through that change process, do you feel that it's useful bringing internal and external people? Like, obviously, we both yeah. um, declare an interest in this, but I think that sometimes it is interesting, isn't it? Because, of course, we touched on, for example, the certain development work that has to be done. It's brilliant doing it in-house. Develop your people, support them, mentor them, and so on. There's so many things that you can do. Mm -hmm. What are the bits where you think that actually it does pay to get somebody else externally in or externally in as well? Tell me your thoughts about that. Uh, I would say this, wouldn't I? But I mean, certainly when, when I was HRD, I used to use third parties quite a lot in terms of a fresh pair of eyes, yeah. helping me think through some of the, the processes and the, and the So it might be for some that's so it might be some that's strategic and that yeah, how you're gonna think yeah, yeah. helping to align your thinking around right. uh, where do we want to get the organisation? Yeah. Are there other ways? And it, it's sort of going back to what I was saying before, which is you know, I'm I love having other people's ideas mm -hmm. and um, I feed off those mm -hmm. ideas. And I think having a partner to help you think through right. where you're heading, what the context is that you're trying to set having somebody ask you some of the tricky questions about, okay, have you thought about X, Y, and Z? What's your plan on this? Right. Um, where, are the, where are the potential derailers? Mm. Um, where is your organization right. that alongside you? So, I'm hearing, so what I'm hearing from you is it could be on a number of levels. It could be on that strategic, that the yeah. board or the leadership exactly. could value from that. But also it might well be within that a manager or a team and it might even be, I guess, on that micro level that I'm new to management or I'm a leader. I'm in a new role or I've just, just been promoted yeah. or I'm struggling with a relationship with somebody oh. or I'm not sure what to do about this particular work problem. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly a coach can help you think those things through oh. and figure out the solution. And I want to ask a last question before we close. For the individual who's watching this, any level, when should they stay and when should they go? Now, what's interesting in your case you left when you loved it. You know, yeah. you, st you were still loving it and you enjoyed it. You went on to do yeah. something that now that you enjoy more and it has so many of those elements in it. But Jeremy, what's your take? Because I guess you've seen this a lot again in organisations. Certain people at all sorts of different points who perhaps should go. You know, maybe they've got more to offer in a new... Any just general thoughts? Yeah. What are the signs when you should perhaps stay and push on and when is it that you should go? I, I think people in their heart of hearts, they know. I think right. it, when it's mm -hmm. fear holding you back, then that's the bit that you need to think about, okay, so what is it that I'm worried about? Right. Um, and yes. work through those things. Got you. But I think if you look inside yourself, you know. I like that. And one last question before we cl close, because, um, and it, it struck my mind earlier, we, sat, we sit here as um, a woman, we sit here as somebody of, of colour, and diversity in the workplace yes. has come up a lot, hasn't yeah. it? And we and we well not so much in this company, but it's so much in the in the oh, public. Yeah, thing. we're talking yeah. about it a lot more. Which is brilliant. Hugely, isn't it? And and, and we know and we and now there's more more evident. We know boardrooms where are the women at senior level. Yeah. I mean, you would have seen this firsthand yeah, at senior level. And where are we when it comes to people of diverse backgrounds, black, minority, ethnic, Asian people of all back yeah. backgrounds, and the white British in, in the workplace. Yeah. What's your take on, on that? Because you would have seen this and you've broken through that. What, what, um, just some th best thoughts, and I know we've, we've only got literally a minute or two to touch on this, but I'd love your, your initial thoughts on, on yeah. that. I and mean, I think we're getting better with women on boards. Yeah. This is a, the, the Davis um, intervention. And for those people who don't know about Lord the Davis. Davis was basically 25% of, of female representation on boards. Uh, on footsie boards right. and we're a lot better. I think in terms of gender, um, there's still not enough women mm -hmm. chief executives. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in terms of senior ethnicity, mm -hmm. there's, there's just simply not well, enough. I've been doing a huge amount of work in the NHS and this is, huge, this is a huge issue. You know, and I think it is about decision makers and inf key influencers. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've been talking, especially about ethnicity, we've been talking about it for years. Yeah. And you know, when is it really going yeah. to change? What's your thought on that? You know, very, very briefly, um, is it that because some people say what happens is consciously or subconsciously, and when you get boards, leadership and whatever, 
people who look like me, think like me, and so on. Yeah. It, it, is, is it that? Is it that there isn't enough um, brickbats and, 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 and uh, slaps if you don't do it? Is it naming and shaming? Is it that there's just not an appetite for it? Um, um, I, don't, I don't think, I, was, I don't think it's that there's not an appetite for it. Mm. I mean, so, I don't think you'd ever hear somebody say that. I'm I'm not aware of it. I'm not a big fan of naming and shaming yeah. because I think people want to get where they're going on their merit. Yeah. They don't if they don't want it to be tokenistic. I certainly wouldn't have wanted mm. to, to get mm. where I've got to, mm. believing that the only reason mm. I did it was because I was a woman. Mm. Mm. You know, I did it because I was good enough. Mm -hmm. and, but I think it's about creating opportunities. Oh, yes. I think it's about talent development. I yes. think it's about looking in different places for your talent because actually if you always go to the same to search for talent, you're always going to get the same people. Do you hire from different schools? Do you develop relationships with, with different schools and universities? Also, I mean, I think one of the things that we did at Channel 4 was quite different for entry level positions was get rid of application forms and do online assessment and assessment centres because actually from a social mobility point of view, if what you're looking for is a certain academic qualification, mm. you are discounting a whole number of It's a really good point. And I've often thought that sometimes in terms of the whole, this is one for another time, the whole interview process, and actually can somebody do the job, all of that kind of stuff. And I'd imagine going back to something you said before, with this thing about gender and diversity, that don't be afraid to, or have the courage to, or challenge yourself to make sure, what kind of an organisation should we look like? Exactly. And as with all your other goals, and go for it. And think about in the business case perspective, there are benefits in today's global economy totally. for you to look totally. like the people who are just you're serving. Well, yes, because actually most companies would, you know, we need to reflect modern Britain, mm. and, and modern Britain is wonderful and, and diverse and, and, you know, all of the, the brilliant things that it is, but if we don't reflect modern Britain in our organisations, what is that telling our customers? Well, you know what, on that note, I love that. I'm going to let you to smile and leave the, uh, look at the camera. Thank you so much, man, for Thank your time you. and wishing you all the best with the wonderful work that you're doing in coaching, organisational development and organisational change. Easy for me to say that, or it should be at least. And thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Take care. Thank you.